I had published three books of poetry and I never thought I was actually going to write a novel and then leaving the Atocha station kind of developed out of I think it developed out of my desire to be able to test some of the ideas I had about poetry in another form. Like one of the things I love about the novel is it's a very curatorial form. Like you can dramatize encounters with poems. You can dramatize encounters with works of visual art. So in a way, I think I wrote a novel because it gave me a kind of vantage from which to explore ideas I had about poetry and poetics. That was, that was part of it. I mean, the true answer is that I don't know how it came about that I started writing novels because I I feel like to a certain degree I'm not in control of what genre I work in. You kind of have to write what it's given you to write. But But I also should say that often I've been doing work that ends up being a part of a novel long before I have a conception of the book. So like I wrote a kind of academic essay about John Ashbery, a poet I admire very much, that in many ways was the seed of the novel and whole pages of the novel actually come out of that essay. But of course, while I was writing that essay, I had no imagination of the ultimate form the novel was going to take. So I think generally speaking, the novel as a curatorial, elastic, absorptive mode that lets me talk about other works of art and constellate different encounters with works of art was part of how I ended up being a kind of accidental novelist. But the truer answer is I have kind of no idea why I've written one thing or another. I was very reluctant to start a novel being a poet. I think I had a kind of, I mean, I read novels and loved novels, but I had kind of half joking this notion that poets and novelists were enemies, that poetry was about a kind of intense formal experience and novels were about plot. Um, And I never knew, like, I never thought I would be a writer who had to, like, move a character from one room to another in prose. But then, at least now, I realize that a lot of the novels I love actually come out of kind of resistance to some of the conventions of novelistic writing. I mean, I think about, like, Thomas Bernhard's writing, which was very enabling for me, in which he writes these sentences that are always kind of repudiations of literary value or repudiations of the dominant artistic modes of the day, but out of these kind of spiraling sentences often of shame and rage, there's a kind of beautiful music that's achieved. I just mean to say that sometimes it's generative um, to write out of a kind of resistance to the genre in which you're participating. So I was resistant to writing a novel, but that resistance was also a mode of energy. I also just think one of the great things about writing in more than one genre is that you can always kind of pretend that you're not doing what you're doing and you can kind of like bypass a certain neurotic structure. Like when I'm writing a poem, I sometimes convince myself that I'm actually taking notes for prose, but then I discover a poetic form that I can unfold. Or when I actually sit down to try to write an essay, it often becomes a work of fiction. So I think of genres as different kinds of laboratories where you can test ideas, but also as ways that you can kind of, you can kind of work against yourself by pretending not to be doing what you're doing. Like I get a lot of writing done when I claim that I'm not writing. You know, I'm just preparing to write. I'm getting ready to write. Somehow that's a more fecund space sometimes than actually sitting down to do the work. I mean, you do have to choose a genre ultimately, but often I think when you're kind of operating in a territory of concern or exploring the possibilities of language, you don't necessarily have a sense of the larger architecture of the work. At least there are moments in which you might be thinking that you're writing an essay. You might in fact be writing an essay, but you're also doing a kind of work that's going to feed back into a fictional world or sometimes you're sharpening a particular phrase in a poem, but that language is going to end up, you know, being the poem of a character in a fictional world, right? So um, there's a long moment of composition where I don't think I have a sense of the genre in which I'm ultimately working. But then eventually, right, there is a formal architecture, and there's a sense of not just what you resist in a genre, but the possibilities of the genre and how the whole history of that genre can be brought to bear in the moment of composition, right? Like I think of, of, I mean, sometimes I think of genre as a frame, 
right? And, and when you're working within a frame, there are all kinds of possibilities that come with that framing, including like strategic ways to disappoint the expectations that attend that framing, right? So one of the great things about working in a genre is it creates a certain set of readerly expectations that you can strategically disappoint, right? So there is a moment in which I embrace a genre and its history to see what might be possible for me, what I want to what tradition I want to honor, what tradition I want to resist. But the best and worst thing about writing is how mysterious it remains for the writer, at least for me. I mean, it's the best thing because you discover what's writable in the act of composition, and that's very inspiring. And it's the worst thing because having written something is no guarantee you're ever going to write anything else. You know, it's not like a stable skill or set of practices where you can know in advance that you're going to. Um, build something worthwhile. I mean, I do have a sense of, of, of plot, but I, but I think that, and this might have something to do with being kind of a poet first, that I think more in terms of pattern than of plot. I think more in terms of motif and the way certain themes can return at intervals, at almost musical intervals, and the way you can build a world up with those structures of repetition. Um, but, but there is plot too, right? I just think that plot for me is primarily uh, n not about dramatic changes in a protagonist's life so much as it's about little differences, small reorientations. Like I'm sometimes most interested in moments in fiction where there's, where a character undergoes a kind of reorientation and identity like in 1004 in one of my novels, for example, it's like full of examples of characters realizing that something they took for granted in their life as fact turns out to be a fiction. Someone learns that her father isn't her father or someone has an experience that turns out to be kind of based upon a misunderstanding, right? And I was really interested in those moments where the world kind of reorients itself as a result of realizing that something that you accepted as an established fact ended up being a fiction, right? And so in a way that novel for me, although there is a plot and there are big questions about biological reproduction and literary reproduction, et cetera, et cetera, for me it's about creating a constellation of these moments where fact becomes fiction and where the fictions by which we live have to be reimagined. It's about creating a kind of yeah, I, I, the constellation's a fine word for it. A constellation of those moments that becomes the tapestry of the work more than it's about like a linear plot. And similarly, like in the Topeka School, which very much has a plot, what I was really interested in were these kinds of different theaters of extreme speech and how I could bring them in relation to one another. Ex versions of extreme speech that I experienced, like high school debate or white kids freestyling in the Midwest in the 90s or the pressurized language of therapy or the pressurized language of poetry. Like how could I bring those theaters of extreme speech into relation and then bring that into relation to the kind of present and some of the, the, um, the fascist buffoonery that passes for public speech in the United States, right? So again, it's about creating an alignment between these different theaters or motifs more than it's just about one paraphrasable story. So I think a little bit more about patterning than plot, but of course that kind of patterning is also a way of, un a way of unfolding a story. And in the Topeka School, a main concern is the kind of prehistory of um, the bankruptcy of American political speech. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Trump's language, right, is that there is a truth in everything that Trump says. And the truth in everything that Trump says is that American political speech is a lie, right? That he reveals the kind of bankruptcy of the language of the political class with such extremity that it's a kind of honesty. And I actually think that like part of his appeal to his supporters is this ironic authenticity, which is, the, which is that, e that every time he talks and contradicts himself so flagrantly that it's almost a more authentic kind of dishonesty than the Bush and Clinton kind of neoliberal du doublespeak, right? So that was, you know, the, the, the kind of disaster of the Trumpian present was the moment in which I was writing the book. But what I wanted to do 
was remember from that present my kind of adolescence in the 1990s and the formation of my own voice including the way that some of those right-wing tendencies or the weaponization of language or political doublespeak or whatever is inside me, right? I mean, it's not just a kind of denunciation of the American from the outside. It's an interrogation of the genealogy of my own voice, right? So I got really interested in how some of my linguistic experiences as an adolescent kind of opened onto the problems of political speech in the present and maybe also gestured, at least for me, you know, towards some alternative possibilities. Um, I, I mean, I also just say that, like, this is maybe an obvious thing, but, but one of the things I love about literature is the way it makes clear how the voice is a corporate technology, right? I mean, I don't mean corporate um, and like the Exxon corporation sense. I mean, corporate in the sense of collective, right? That, that we don't have some asocial interiority that's the domain of our voice. Our voice is this tissue of contradictions that's influenced by family, by mass media, by political speech, whatever, right? And that one of the things a novel can do is kind of reveal all the voices that go into a voice, right? And Adam Gordon in the Topeka School who's an adolescent for most of the novel is, you know, adolescence is also a time in which, you know, your voice is literally cracking and your sense of the voice as a precarious embodied technology is really heightened often in a kind of anxious way, often in a comic way. So I wanted to think about the formation of the voice for this young man caught between these different regimes of talk, right? You know, he has psychologist parents from the coast, Jewish psychologist parents from the coast, but he's also trying to kind of pass as a real man in a masculinist culture. I mean, these, I'm overstating it, right? It's a little bit of a reduction, but those are, he, he feels himself kind of um, torn between these different attitudes towards speech and expressivity. But so I think in a novel that, w one of the things that the novels that I love do anyway is show the circulation of language through like the way that social forces circulate on the individual level the way that 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 we often parrot speech that we receive from one medium or another even in our most intimate exchanges and to kind of show the way being an individual is not having a voice that's protected from the world it's actually the way you manage the collective voice as it passes through you, if that makes sense. The ambition to show how the voice is a social technology is a really traditional novelistic concern. Um, I mean, I think it's a, it can be a really radical subject for a novel when, when, when a writer really pushes the form to reckon with, with the tension, you know, between our experience as individuals right and and our, our, our sense of wanting to push back against the social and also our sense that instead of controlling language language speaks us right and poetry and fiction both um at its most powerful to me is caught up in that in that dialectic and then certain writers i think kind of have like let that go into a certain kind of stable omniscience right, which can become a kind of moribund set of realistic conventions or whatever. But absolutely, whether it's Toni Morrison or Thomas Mann, that, that relationship between, you know, when am I speaking language and when is language speaking me is foundational for the novel as a form and I think also foundational for poetry. I think that's a, that's a moment where poetic technique and novelistic technique have a shared concern. It's interesting to think about how you create what it means, how a voice comes into being in a novel um, or a poem. I mean, I think for me, it's, it's so for example, in the Topeka School, the, the Topeka School became writable for me actually when I realized that, I, that there was a voice I couldn't write in. And the voice I couldn't write in was the way I would have spoken as an adolescent. Like for a long time, I wanted to write that novel like in a first person adolescent voice of Adam Gordon and I couldn't do it for various reasons like one, one of the problems was I only knew how to do it as parody like I would I only knew how to make fun of my teenage speech and what I realized was actually that the key for the novel the novel became writable for me when those passages of the young Adam Gordon were written in the third person 
but the first person sections were given over to the older generation, to his parents, to versions of my parents. Because part of the experiment of the Topeka school is to kind of remember my childhood from the perspective of my parents, which was a vantage that only became possible for me as I became older and when I had kids. And when you have kids, you know, it's, uh, or at least for me, it's kind of like, um, like you ever look at bonsai trees and you're, you both kind of imagine yourself under the tree because it's, you know, it looks massive at the same time as it's miniaturized, but then you're also above it. You're both under it and floating above it. You're in two kind of scales at once. That's what being a parent is like for me. You know, like I'm, I'm looking down at my daughter, right, at the young child, but I also remember what it was like with a new intensity to be that kid looking up right? You're both the child and the parent at once. And the Topeka school is a similar kind of doubling. I want to remember my childhood, but from the perspective of my parents. So what I realized was that actually I could write a version of my mother's voice. I could write a version of my father's voice. But, but, but crucially, in the novel, it's not about creating a perfect mimesis of the voice. It's not that I actually want to disappear into that voice. It's that I want to dramatize the effort of a child to speak in the parent's voice. And there are glitches or tears in the voice. There are moments when it's clearly not the parent speaking. It's Adam Gordon trying to imagine the way the parents speak. So those tears or glitches in the voice and the dramatization of the effort to speak in the voice of the older generation, that's where the pathos and intellectual charges for me, not in the like accomplished fact of the polished, perfect voice of the other, but the recognition that it's an imaginative act that's always flawed and limited, that certain parts of the other whose voice you're imagining remain opaque or unintelligible. That's, that's the experiment for me. And I also just think that, that, you know, there's this infinite regress of the voice. Like one of the questions for Adam Gordon is, you know, how much is, of his grandfather's voice is in him or not in him and how much can he edit that out and how much is the voice of his debate coach in him or not in him and what does he want to embrace from that and what does he want to repudiate. So, so the book is, when, when I talk about trying to write in these voices or how, I, how one finds a voice, I think you find the voice not through polish or a notion of purity, but through the impurities of the voice, the corporate nature of the voice, the contradictions in the voice, the tears and glitches in the voice. Laying all that bare to me seems to be the kind of exciting moment of composition. I really love the poet Robert Creeley. And part of what I love about Robert Creeley's work is the way he has these expressive failures of expression. Right. So like Creeley has this poem for love and the whole poem is this kind of effort to make a definitive statement about love and the failure to ever actually arrive at a definitive statement. And you feel all the hesitation and doubling back in his enjammed lines. Right. And it's it's the it's it's actually the, the dramatization of the failure to make a clear statement about love that becomes mimetic of the experience of living and loving in time, right? So it's like part of the of the literary artistry I'm most interested in and that I that I that I read for is where where the breakdown of the form can be expressive, where the breakdown of the voice um, you know, gestures towards something that would be falsified by polish, you know. And there's, you know, there, there are poems that are these amazing idealized images of speech, right? Like a Shakespearean sonnet. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a mimesis of speech, but nobody talks that way, right? I mean, and, and, but there's, I mean, I love Shakespeare sonnets, right? But, but there's also a kind of poetry or a kind of fiction writing or a kind of art making that wants to think about the ways that the form can break down right? And, and that a breakdown in form can be truer to the experience that one is attempting to capture than the most polished statement about, right, the limits of the voice or the most polished statement about, um, you know, uh, an experience of disorientation. So how, how you, 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 you polish, I mean, I work hard at, right, like trying to get it right. Of course, I always fail to get it right. You pol but sometimes what you have to polish is your, Sometimes what you have to what you have to work on and edit for years or whatever is actually like the flaws in the form, 
right? Respecting the flaws in the form or figuring out how to stage decay in a voice, um, how to honor that limit as opposed to how to, how to just be eloquent. There are sometimes works of art where I feel pacified by the eloquence of the writer and I don't feel like I'm being invited to participate in a formal experience in the same way. And I'm sure I make that mistake too. I mean, I'm sure people would say that of things I've written, but that is the weird challenge of literary composition, right? Is that when, when, our, when our felt silences or fragmentation or breakdowns in the form um, a more authentic technique than mere eloquence, no matter how eloquent, you know, one is.